And the next is a, the scripture reading. It comes from uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, it's on the screen behind me. Uh, it's also in your Bibles. It's the New Revised Standard Version because that's the Pew Bible here. And uh, so uh, if you would just follow along as I read, okay? Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Oh, I got to click that. Sorry about that. And uh, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. May God bless us for having read that portion from his word. Now, um, <clears throat> you might have to advance that for me. Yeah, there we go. All right. A few technical issues that we're working on. My topic today is the Jesus Built Church. And uh, there's a lot of uh, contemporary models for church. And after looking at a lot of them, I finally concluded that my model of ministry that I want to have is the Jesus Built model. Now, uh, Rick Warren has built a huge church out in California, the Saddleback Church, on the purpose-driven model. I like that model too, okay? And uh, Willow Creek Church has built a huge church on the seeker model. I like that model too. And uh, I know some really, I have some friends who are charismatic, and they, they follow the charismatic model. Well, I like some of their model, but not all of it. I love their enthusiasm. I really do. They're, they're excited and motivated about Jesus. Um, and, and then there's the contemporary model. There's the traditional model. There's all these models of how the church is. You, you run the church. A, a popular one from the Southern Baptist that we're doing in the American Baptist is called the missional model. And it goes through the book of Acts on the, the mission that they had in the book of Acts. I like that model too. But my favorite model is the Jesus-built model. And I want to talk about that today. And there's three foundations for this Jesus built model. And uh, uh, three layers. And so there's three steps here. There's step one. That's going to be the, the, the primary foundational level. The second level. And then a the third level. And, and I want to talk about these three levels today. But every time you come into church, I want you to remember there's three steps because there's three foundations of the Jesus built model. Okay? And, and the, the first model... Uh, the, the first level of this, this model uh, is actually the great confession. We've just read about that. But before I do, uh, have any of you ever seen uh, a guy by the name of Jesse Waters on cable TV? Jesse Waters. Anybody see? Yeah, there's some hands going up. He's on Fox, and, and he does this thing. Uh, you know, I'm Waters, and you're in my world. Now, now, do you remember that? Anybody remember that? Okay. What he does is he goes out on the street, and he asks people, uh, political issues. What do they know about? And they might even be like showing a picture of somebody like President Obama and say, do you know who that is? And somebody else say like Martin Luther King and say, like, how could you, how could you miss that? And, and he just kind of exposes like a uh, political disconnect of people. And, and uh, so, and, and he does that kind of thing. Uh, if you don't know about him, maybe you know about uh, Jay Leno. Jay Leno? Uh, he used to have a thing called uh, jaywalking, where he would go out on the street and he would ask people similar questions and say, uh, who is this? And show a picture of George Bush, and, and people wouldn't know who it was, and, and kind of expose how really disconnected we are from everyday reality. Well, before there was Jesse Waters, before there was Jay Leno, there was Jesus. And Jesus said, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And so the disciples respond, okay? So we, they've been out on the street, and they've been mixing with the crowd, and, and they, they've had their own little interviews, and they respond to, to Jesus. And they, some say, you're John the Baptist. Some say, you're Elijah. Uh, still others say, you're Jeremiah or, or one of the prophets. And he says, it's kind of like Jay Leno, Jay walking, you know, uh, Jesse's world, where they're coming up with the wrong answers, 
And so Jesus says, but, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter, I love Peter. Peter speaks first, thinks later, but this time he got it right. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. The word Messiah comes from the Hebrew, Mashiach. The word Christ comes from the Greek, Christos. Both Mashiach and Christos means anointed one. You are the anointed one of God. You've been anointed by God to bring salvation. This is, right here, the great confession of our faith. Jesus, you are the Christ. Then he adds, the Son of the living God. He's saying that, Jesus, I know that you are God's Son, so you are deity. You are God come in the flesh. This is the Christmas story in a nutshell. God with us. This is the great confession, and I know it is the great confession because of what Jesus goes on to say. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Now, now if we were to put that in modern language, his name is Simon, we'd say the son of Johnson. Simon Johnson, okay? Because he's the son of Jonas. He said, blessed are you, Simon. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. You did not come to this conclusion on your own. My Father was working in your heart and in your life in such a way that the Spirit removed the blinders from your eyes, and you now see for real who I am. It takes a divine work of God's grace for us to see and call upon Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then he adds, and I tell you, you are Peter. Now, the word Peter is Petras. You are, the word Petras um, means rock. Jesus had nicknamed Simon with the nickname Rock, or we'd say today, Rocky. He called him Rocky. The first time he met him in John chapter 1. It's, it's prophetic. Jesus sees, sees Peter, Simon, and he says, uh, you will no more be called uh, Simon. We're going to call you Rocky. Because he knows the day is coming when Simon is going to make the great confession, and it's upon that rock of that confession that he is going to build the church. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock, and, and there's a, a difference between Peter and the rock there, the one that's Petra and the one that's Petras. One's a little stone, that's you, Peter, but upon this large, boulder, stone, rock of the confession that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is this first foundational stone You've got to confess. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Romans, said that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. When I, in my heart, believe in Jesus... The righteousness of Jesus is put to my account as my sins were put to his account. He suffered and bled and died for them, paid in full the price of them. And, but the moment I believe a transaction takes place, his righteousness is put to my account. It says, he that believes that righteousness is put into his account. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. When you confess the Lord, you're saved. And what we have in this passage is the foundation upon which the Jesus-built church is established. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You accept him as your Savior. You confess him as your Savior and your Lord. Well, now, the, the second is the great commandment. The next layer of this foundation of the Jesus-built church. When Jesus is building his church, uh, people follow the great commandment. And from that, I want to go to the Gospel of Luke. 
In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says there was a lawyer. A verse before this said he was trying to test and trip up Jesus. And in trying to test and trip up Jesus, the lawyer stood up and, uh, to test Jesus. And he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question. And he said to him, well, what is written in the law? You know, it's Jesus when he's asked a question. He normally doesn't give the answer. He gives you an answer, a uh, question back, so that you have to do your own self-discovery in this. And he's doing that with this young man. He says to him, what is written in the law? What do you read? Well, because he knows this lawyer, this attorney, is trying to trip him up, he throws back a question because of the question, and, and then he says, he answers of the lawyer does, he says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and you will, you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Good answer. He's taken two different verses out of the Old Testament, merged them together, and this has become the great commandment. It sums up all the law and the prophets. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. That's God word. And that, that, that is to impact your life in such a way that you love your neighbor as yourself. And he's answered this correctly, but the law was never given to save a life. Notice the word all in there. You've got to love him with all your heart. Can I add a, a little extra part to this to make it a little clearer? Put in there all the time. I gotta love the Lord to God with all my heart all the time, with all my soul all the time, with all my strength all the time, with all, all of me all the time. And I gotta love my neighbor. You have met my neighbor. <laughs> like myself all the time. You know what the problem here is? None of us can do that. None of us can do that. It's so simple because the Bible says all have sinned. Once we've sinned, we've got a sin nature. I've got a bent towards doing evil, not doing good. And so when it comes to keeping this, I can't keep it. He should have been at this point just like the, uh, the man that was in the temple that beat his breast and said, be merciful to me, a sinner, because I can't do it all the time. But rather than beat his breast, Jesus said to him, hey, you've given the right answer, do this and you will live. The problem is you can't do that. You need a Savior. You need to call Jesus. You need a confession. You need to call upon the Lord in order to be saved. And then you can start to try to fulfill the great commandment. But wanting to justify himself... He wants to you know, make himself feel good about uh, what his answer... That, this is what he does. He says, who is my neighbor? Oh, listen, on a technicality, if I can't define who my neighbor is, then I can't do the, I can't do the commandment. And, and so uh, he asks a very simple question back to Jesus. Who is my neighbor? It's at this point Jesus tells us the story of the Good Samaritan. You all remember that story? Yeah, I hope you do. It's a story about a man that is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You go down. Jerusalem is always up. You always go up. To, no matter what direction you're at, you go, up to Jer you go up to Jerusalem. So when you leave Jerusalem, you're always going down. So he's leaving Jerusalem. He's going down to Jericho. A and uh, somehow he gets in a bad company. He gets robbed, beaten up. They take all of his possessions. He's left half dead. A and then what happens next is a Levite comes by. I think it was really a priest. A priest comes by. He's also going down, which means he's been in the temple. He's, he's going home from church, folks. And, and he's on his way home, and, and uh, he sees this guy all beat up, and it says he passes over on the other side. But I know how this works, because I've watched people on the highway. There's an accident up ahead. You uh, pull over, but then you slow down so you get an eyeful. I think that's what's going on here. Moved over in the lane... Get a good eyeful, but didn't do anything to help the man. Next comes a Levite. The priest was actually, he did priestly service. The Levite took care of things in the temple. These are two religious people. Same thing happens, man. He just swerves out of the way, gets an eyeful. And then he tells in the story here, because he's talking to a Jewish fellow, he says, then came a Samaritan. The Samaritan is the enemy. Jews hated Samaritans because they were not full-blooded Jews. They were very prejudicial. 
The Samaritan comes along, and so this, oh, immediately, he doesn't like this guy. But he stops and he helps him. He pours in oil and wine. He binds up his, his injuries. He puts him on his donkey, and he takes him to an inn, and he tells the innkeeper, here, I'm going to give you two denarii so that you can pay uh, for his keep. And, and however long it takes, on my way back, I will, I'll pay whatever I, he still owes. And he says, which of these three was the man's neighbor? You see, Jesus answered the question with a question. He told the story, set up the question. He answered that. I was preaching this passage uh, years ago at the First Baptist Church of Pontiac. And uh, not this message, but the message on the Good Samaritan. And uh, it was a good message. I even had a good humor point in it. I gave a joke, and everybody roared and laughed. I mean, it was a good message. And, and so after, I had an evening service I had to, to speak at as well. And so the church is up on M59, and I'd like to get there a little bit early. And I'm driving down the road, and there's this big, long line of cars backed up in the right-hand lane. And I said, I look, I know I can make it. I can get around them, go past, cut back in, it's, and get to the church parking lot, because I want to be there a little early. So I punch it, and sure enough, as I'm driving along, I see this idiot. He's driving on a flat tire. The rubber is all mangled and the wheel is actually, the steel rims hitting the concrete. Sparks are flying everywhere. <laughs> and I whip around just in time. to those whoosh, Go right into the parking lot. I pull into the parking lot, put on my brake, I stop. I, I'm there a little early. I open up my Bible. I want to review what I'm going to be speaking on. Now, this morning, I've just spoken on the Good Samaritan. All of a sudden, I smell the smell of burnt tire. I look up. The guy is pulling in in the parking lot right next to me. All of a sudden, Good Samaritan hits me. So I get out of the car, and I go, and I say, Hey, man, looks like you got a flat tire. I'll give you a hand putting your spare tire on. We open it up. The trunk, no spare tire. I say, Oh, man, we're going to have to call a tow truck. So uh, I decide we're going to call a tow truck. And, and just at that moment, my brother Dave shows up. Now, Dave was going to be here today, but he had a business trip, took him away. And I was going to... Really put him on the spot and all that, but he, he's not here. Maybe next week. But <laughs> he shows up, and he was a body repair man. And uh, he comes over, and he looks at me, and I said, he said, what's the problem? I said, well, he's got a flat tire. <laughs> Duh. And, uh, and, and he doesn't have a spare. So he looked at me and said, give him yours. <laughs> I'm thinking, no, you give him yours. So I said, you give them yours. He said, oh, no, mine won't fit. Yours will. Give them yours. <laughs> sure enough, his lug pattern, my brother's in the car wouldn't work, but my lug pattern does. So we open up my trunk. We take my spare tire out. We put it on his car. And uh, my brother does all this. He's, I'm just watching. My spare tire is going to be driving. Sure enough, my spare tire was driving out of the parking lot and away as I was walking in to preach the Sunday evening message. You say, man, you were a good Samaritan. No, not really. I was a very reluctant good Samaritan. My brother Dave says to me at the end, he said, don't worry, I'll get you another one tomorrow. He said, we get all these towed cars in. They got good spare tires. I just get you a brand new one tomorrow. You know what? I was so worried about, hey, I'm going to be driving home. I know how this works. It's Murphy's Law. <laughs> I gave away my spare tire. I'm going to have a flat tire on the way home. Somebody could be passing me say, look at the idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I know I don't have a spare tire, yeah, he's a really dumb idiot. <laughs> yeah, you know how that works. And so, but I'm telling you something. To be a neighbor person of the great confession, I confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I follow the great commandment, love my neighbor as myself, it costs me something. Cost me something. It cost the good Samaritan two denarii, and we don't know how much more. I don't know if he was using cable TV at that end. <laughs> If he was just racking up the bill, I don't know. But it cost you something. If you think you could be a good 
Samaritan. You can be a person who keeps the great commandment and say that you'll love the Lord with all your heart and worship him on Sunday. Listen to me, on the way home, you better be loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's going to cost you something. Well, the third foundation where Jesus builds a church, you start with a great confession, you strive to live the great commandment. And the third one is you pursue the Great Commission. The Great Commission. In uh, Matthew chapter 28, it talks about the resurrection of Christ. In the verses prior to verse 19, verse 18, it says, All authority is given me under heaven and upon earth. Jesus has all the authority in the world. Think about it. He's resurrected from the dead. God has given him all the authority. He can do anything he wants. It's a good thing he hadn't crucified me and raised me from the dead. Because I said, hey, Pilate, you got something coming to you. <laughs> Caiaphas, you got a few things coming to you, right? Yeah. I don't get even, I get ahead. You know, that kind of thing. Not so with Jesus. All authority. He can do anything that he wants. And this is what he does. He takes these 11 misfits. There were 12, but one's already hung himself, Judas. He's, he's gone. He takes these 11 misfits and he says, I have a plan to reach the whole world and I'm putting it in your hands. Can you imagine what the angels must have thought in heaven? Going to thought, what in the world is Jesus thinking now? These 11 guys are going to change the whole world? And God says, yeah, this is the plan. This is the plan. This is what Jesus says to them. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Disciples, followers. What do we follow? This is it right here, folks. I follow the great confession. I tell somebody to follow me in confessing Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You, you build on this foundation. This is the starting point. You have to have Jesus as your Savior. Then what do you do? You, you live loving God with all your heart. You, you worship God with all your heart. And, and, and you... You love your neighbor as yourself. You do Christian service. You, you share with people. But it doesn't stop there. He says, you make a disciple because they come to faith and they're growing in their faith. And, and, and what you do is you make a disciple. They're followers of Jesus. And he goes on to say, it doesn't end when they just have this conversion experience and they're doing good. He says, and baptizing them. Baptizing them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing is to identify publicly with the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. You're saying, publicly, I am a Christian. Then he doesn't stop there. He says, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Teaching them. What do we teach them? You go to the book of Acts, and it says, when they received the word, they were baptized and they were added to the church. It's in the church that you're taught. I am a Bible preacher, teacher. Probably more teacher than preacher. I want to teach the word. If you sit in my ministry, you will grow in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will grow in your knowledge of the grace of God. You will grow in the Bible. Because I, I'm about the book. I'm about the book. But I'm also about making disciples. Making followers. First time it happened in my life, I was 16 years old. Our church was, uh, we had a youth group that started with like five or six of us kids, and at the point where this happened to me, we were probably about 40 strong. Our youth group grew to be over 100 kids. There would be, on our Sunday evening services at church, more teenagers than there were anyone else. Good problem to have, huh? Yeah. This is what happened. A kid had come to our church. His name was Butch. He came from Denver, and he had attended the Baptist High School in Denver. I didn't even know there were Baptist high schools. All right? And so our youth group was growing. He decided we're going to have our own visitation program. We're going to go visit the kids that hadn't showed up for a while. So he jumped in my car, three of us guys, and we drove to this kid's house, Tim Gunning. He was... He was on our church softball team, and he had been missing for a little bit, and we stopped by. He had a friend there. And, and uh, my buddy Butch, somehow we got talking about Jesus. I just went there to invite him to church. Got talking about Jesus. Next thing I know, 
he's got a Bible out. He's going through what later I learned was a Romans road. Anybody familiar with Romans road? You ever heard that expression, Romans road? It's key verses in the book of Roman. And he just went down through those key verses. When he got done, he asked him if he would like to pray and ask Jesus to be his Savior. They make a confession of faith. I'm looking at my buddy Butch and saying, man, where did this come from? How do you, whoa, this is cool. The kid prayed and accepted Jesus as his Savior. You know what I said? I can do that. That wasn't so hard. I can do that. So I went out and bought myself a little New Testament. <laughs> it's not this one, but it was this size. I went through and I marked every verse that he had used. Now I had those verses down, underlined in my Bible. I went out hunting. But I had a plan. I wasn't going to do it on anybody I knew. I was going to get a complete stranger. So uh, I was looking one night. I, had, I was in my car driving. I saw a hitchhiker up ahead back in the days when hitchhiking was a little safer. So I said to myself, I'm going to stop and pick this guy up. So I did. I swung over by the curb, reached over, pushed on the door handle, shoved it out, and yelled, hop in if you don't mind riding with a religious fanatic. <laughs> I'm expecting a total stranger. Guy gets in and says, hey, Dennis, what do you mean? You're a religious fanatic. I look, and it's a friend of mine, Bill. <laughs> oh, my goodness, did my plan go wrong? <laughs> so, I went to plan B. I started just talking about church. I didn't go through the verses. I mean, it was like, I, I, it just threw me off track. I was derailed. So I'm talking about our youth group, what God's doing and everything. I took him right to his house because that's where he's going. I pulled him in the driveway and said, hey, you know, you ought to come to church sometime. So he hopped out and, you know, yeah, I'll go with you sometime. And so he went in the house. Next day, I was going to pick up my girlfriend at the time to take her to work. And, and uh, as I'm driving along, um, uh, I pick her up. And but as we're driving along, I see him out hitchhiking again, same guy. So I swung by, picked him up. Now we got a tag team, two of us, my girlfriend and I. We start talking about church, and we're talking about being saved and what God's doing in our kids' lives at church. Our group is growing. We're just, we're just talking. I drop her off, and then we're talking. And finally, I looked over and said, Bill, I got the courage. I was going to do it. Here, I'm going for the kill. Bill, are you saved? Bill looks at me and says, no, but I'm going to be. I said, you're going to be. Now, listen, I'd never expected that answer. In a whole, and nobody's ever said that since. He's the only person ever said, no, but I'm going to be. So I responded. I said, well, Bill, when are you going to be? He said, as soon as you tell me how. I reached, got that Bible out right there in the front seat of my car. He's sitting in a passenger seat. I'm sitting right there. We, we pull over. I'm going through the Romans road. I'm going every verse that I'd marked up. I'm reading it and talking to him. And Bill, right there in the front seat of my car, prayed and asked Jesus to be his Savior. Isn't that great? Story doesn't end there. Bill goes home and tells his brother. His brother comes to youth group. Guess what? His brother gets saved. So now the two of them go home and tell their sisters. Their two sisters come to church. Guess what? The two sisters get saved. That was everybody but mom and dad. Mom and dad are a little worried because their kids are in some kind of religious fanatical cult. So they got to come to church, check this out. Guess what happens? Mom and dad get saved. Whole family gets baptized together. Isn't that great? Whole family joins church. The Great Commission. You see, the Jesus-built church is not what we do. It's what Jesus does through us. It starts with a confession of faith, who, who, who Christ is. You admit, you acknowledge, you confess, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You pursue the great commandment to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and to love others like you love yourself. It doesn't stop there. Until I go out and I tell people about Jesus. When we become a congregation telling people about the Lord Jesus, Jesus will build his church. And he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's the only organization, only organism, only entity on earth. I am guaranteed success. He doesn't plan, he, God doesn't promise that he's going to bless your business, but he does, I'm going to build my church. I will build my church when I plug into the Jesus-built church model. I adhere to the great confession, great commandment, and the great commission. I don't know if you've made that great confession. I don't know you. I trust that you have. 
In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make the great confession. We're going to pray. Some of you say, well, I've already made it. Well, you can pray it again because it hadn't changed since the day you first made it. But if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You're, you're on the starting layer of the foundation. Then we're going to all leave this place. And I don't know what idiot is out there riding on a flat tire that God's going to bring into your life and you're going to have to serve him as your neighbor, as yourself. Today, this week. And all of us have to look for those God-given moments where the door is opened to tell that person about Jesus. About Jesus. About Jesus, the Great Commission. Let's pray. While heads are bowed, I want us all to pray this prayer together. Some of you might be the very first time. It's a prayer of confession saying that I confess you as my Savior and Lord. So pray with me. Father in heaven, I call on you now in a heart of faith because I believe in Jesus as my Savior. I confess him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father in heaven, I continue in prayer. I thank you, Lord, that you've called me to this, this flock to be the shepherd. I pray, Father, that uh, as I lead in the pastures of your word, it would speak to hearts. Perhaps today there was someone who for the very first time said, you know what, Lord, I meant that from my heart. I do believe with all my heart in Jesus. Give them assurance today that they are saved. They've begun a new spiritual journey. We know that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. Let them see you do a great work so old things are gone and all new things come. Father, in a moment we'll give an invitation for those who would like to become members or be baptized or even just to confirm their confession of faith. Pray that you'd move in hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.